then I want and I need everybody to accept that we might see one, two, three percent, four percent, five percent even price increases in our products until that moment occurs. Okay, have I got an idea? See this print here? Yes, this print right here. I am going to give it away to anybody. I'm gonna send it to anybody anywhere in the world. And all you have to do to be in the running to win it is subscribe to my Instagram, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and tell me in the comments of this video why you love photography so much. And we will judge that at the same time as we are judging the other competition, the Freedom Print competition, and we'll let you know who wins. And just one last point, if you are the winner, you've got to be prepared to film yourself with the print, holding it up, because I would love to put it on the channel and show the world who won the print. So as long as you're happy to do that, all good. All right, let's start the video. G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so very good to see you. I do hope you're well. Are you well? Today, I want to talk about the burst bubble of the camera industry and what should our expectations be in regards to our camera company of choice sony canon nikon panasonic fuji olympus it doesn't matter they're all going through the same problem that the bubble burst the market's heading back to where it was 30 years ago and they've all had to restructure to fit in this brave new world So here we are. We are enthusiast photographers. We love the art, we love the craft. For some of us, it's a job, it's a profession. We need our equipment. We are not people that are gonna start using a Samsung or an Apple smartphone for the purpose of photography. This is not what we're gonna do. So we're people that still want cameras that we can hold in our hands and lenses that we can change and lenses that we can choose this is super important to us and what I want to talk about in this video is setting our expectations of what the future might look like so all the camera companies out there they've had to they've had to deal with this massive decline in the industry and not only have they had to deal with that but the last 12 months have shown us how kind of fragile the world is with COVID-19, of course, and this has had another economic hit that nobody was expecting. And the companies now have to assess what do they need to do to survive? Three, four, five years ago, they put in play plans for restructuring and resizing, getting themselves back to the size they would have been 30 odd years ago to continue to be fantastic camera suppliers. in the last act of that journey as the story goes the third act of that journey of resizing and what is the third act showing or giving them well the world is unstable COVID-19 has ravaged the planet and when I say ravaged I mean let's face it people who travel usually want to take a good camera they haven't been able to do that there's a lot of travel being shut down whether it's domestic or international International travel has been completely out for almost a year here in Australia, except for very special circumstances. Travellers into a country, what do they do? They go to fun parks, they go to zoos, they go to all sorts of places and they get photographs taken of them. And that's photographers being employed. 
I, as a photographer, the ability to shoot when we were in lockdown was hard lockdown for five months, no shooting at all. But also what I'm finding now is the industry, industries in general, are taking a little while to get back on their feet. So when will photography to return to where it was, commercial photography? Could be another year or two. I also, as a photographer, publish books and calendars and cards and all sorts of different things which you can buy. And a massive part of my market is tourism. That's not possible. The manufacturing industry has been hit particularly hard with this, not only the contraction in the industry as a whole, but of course COVID-19 with all the things that I've just talked about. And now companies have to assess, they have to assess what is their market, their traditional market doing, what are their customers doing, and what are their competitors doing to survive. And that means change, all sorts of change. And at the moment, some examples we're seeing of that is how, for example, Nikon are changing their great warranties, which are becoming a little more reduced, I suppose, as I've talked about in a previous video. Warranties are something that I really never had to engage, so it feels irrelevant. At the end of the day, it's just a safety net. It's insurance that essentially a company gave you for free. Well, sure. That insurance that you got for free is no longer there. Of course you can get your own insurance and it's not particularly expensive. But things are changing. And how I would like to set everybody's expectations is we love what we do, we love photography, we love the craft, we love the gear, we love every aspect of it. We love the journey, we love the, the chase of the elusive, awesome image. That's not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. We all buy equipment at different rates. That's just the way it is. But I would say the majority of people don't buy at most more than one or two pieces of equipment per year in normal circumstances, not when there's this massive transition that hasn't really happened before for any of us. The generational shift, multi-generational shift from DSLR to mirrorless. So what is going to happen as the market returns to where it was 30 odd years ago, is there is not the economies of scale for Canon, for Nikon, for Sony, Olympus, Fuji, Panasonic, Leica, Hasselblad, Phase One, Pentax. Those economies of scale are not what they've been 10 years ago. This means the costs, the general costs go up because you cannot amortize a site a wage, the CEO, R&D across say 10 million cameras, you've got to do it across 1 million cameras. You've got to cut costs or you've got to make things more expensive. Now we as consumers, we have a choice, don't we? We have a choice with the relationship that we have with our ca camera manufacturer of choice. And the choice is this in regards to warranties. The warranties can continue to be long, for example, in Canada, it has been five years on lenses. It can continue to be long, but the camera manufacturers will have to start charging you more because they're losing their economies of scale. Your body, the camera body you buy will cost more. Or the camera manufacturer can endeavor 
to keep the RRP roughly where it is. Obviously these things change for all sorts of reasons like changing to mirrorless, like when new products come out and like when there are currency differences between countries. It happens in Australia all the time. Our dollar has gone from 50, 60 cents 20 years ago up to being, this is against the US, against the greenback, up over a dollar. So we, we were uh, we were able to buy US dollars for like 95 cents or something Australian. Back down to 50 or 60 cents at the middle of last year and now it's back up at 80 cents. We are all over the place. We can never rely on the price of any of our goods because anything electronic, almost everything electronic is imported and even Australian companies like uh, Atomos and Blackmagic Design who are Australian companies but they peg their prices on the US dollar. So prices for things for us here just change year to year and even quicker and it's literally based on the US currency. So it's all over the shop for us. Even fluctuations in prices from the original manufacturer we don't even necessarily notice because of how our dollar changes. We even see it with Apple products. Apple kind of do it every year. They, they just sort of peg it and just do it annually and they will receive gains and losses depending on where the dollar is going. But at, an I'm, at the top of the range iMac used to be when our dollar was strongest, you know, $3,000 and right now it's five, almost $5,000. Now that's a massive difference for businesses to incur just because our dollar changes against the greenback, but that's how it is. But back to the point that I was making, if we just always look at US dollars, as economies of scale reduce, camera manufacturers have got to make savings somewhere or they charge us more. Now, the choice they are giving us with these changes in warranties is this. A warranty is a type of insurance, the warranty is reducing, but hopefully they are able to keep the cost of the camera uh, and taking into account all those variances we just talked about. Hopefully they can keep the cost of the, the camera the same and then it's up to the end user to make the choice as to whether they want an extended warranty. And what I find is, because a, a lot of electronic resellers now offer these extended warranties, you know, you might have one or two year warranties, which are not even relevant in this country, but they still exist. And then they try and sell you another two or three or four or five years. And for peace of mind, you can get that two or three or four or five years of extended warranty. That is up to you. It's insurance. And what I've found is it's usually just a couple of percentage points of the buy price. So let's say your camera is $1,000 then that extended warranty might be 10, 20 or $30. It's a pretty small price to pay if you're worried. Sometimes I do it on a product I don't know. When it, when it comes to Apple products, I never do it because I know Apple products go forever. And it's the same for Nikon products. I have never purchased an extended warranty because my track record is I've never had to engage my warranties. It's just the way that it is. So ask yourself the question, do you want the price of your camera, and that's so relative around the world as we've discussed, to try and stay the same as the economies of scale reduced for manufacturers? Or would you like the price to go up for every single camera, every single purchase, and it'll be the same for everyone. So it'll be the same for me who doesn't even, I've never even thought or used or that worried about extended warranties on these products. That's what happens, it'll be applied to all of us. Or should that insurance just be user base for each individual can make their own decision. And this is not taking into account the fact that warranties, as we've already discussed in this video here, warranties around the world are starting to change and uh, consumer law is basically superseding or overriding warranties. In this country, I'll just quickly touch on it, basically consumer law says, there's an expectation on how long this product should last. They don't stipulate an amount of time, but it's certainly longer than one year. So, so part of all of this might be simply the fact that around the world, consumer law is now becoming more powerful and more relevant than a warranty. So there's just simply no point for Nikon, Canon or Sony to carry this stuff on their books 
because it would be sitting on their books. They do need to think about it. They, know, they do need to worry about it. It's complicated, but I don't think to just simply assume that this is a big negative and a big fail, which I'm seeing in certain commentaries and certain places on the internet. It's just not as simple as that. And be mindful that if you still want your five year warranty, we might all have to pay for it for you. Whereas I personally would prefer the choice of either extending it or actually getting insurance or simply rolling the dice that I have faith in my product that it will last two, three, five years. And certainly my experience with Nikon 99.999% of the time, because I just can't quite say 100% because it's been so many years, it's been decades that I've had this equipment. I haven't made a warranty claim. But it's critical. Do you want your cameras to cost more? Every single device, accessory, lens to cost more so we can cover that insurance for everybody? Or should we, as consumers, in the end just make choices around perhaps I will extend the warranty on this piece of equipment, but not that? I would prefer to keep the base price low myself, the base price low, and then add and subtract warranties and insurance as I see fit. And yes, I'm a working professional, but I would still consider simply just rolling the dice and going, I believe in this product and I believe it will outlive my consumer warranty as well as my warranty. I will expect it to definitely work for three to five years. And my anecdotal experience is it will work kind of as it'll just keep going that's the feedback so if you go and look at that video that i just mentioned you will see in the comments that something like 90 to 95 percent of people fit in the same category as me that they've had none or maybe one warranty claim in their entire collection so it's just a numbers game you could also, like I do, simply go, all right, well, I will have a one in 30 failure, but I'm not going to insure or warranty anything. And I, I, I just pay for that one in 30 and that will be cheaper than the insurance or the extended warranty. It'll actually just be cheaper to just see what happens. It's just a safety net. It's just insurance. Please do not forget that the camera industry is contracting and we will pay more. I wanna end this video by saying, please do not forget that we have been through the most ridiculous bubble, which was at its peak about a decade ago where cameras were selling like crazy. Everybody thought they were going to be a photographer. Everybody went out and bought a Canon 5D or a Nikon D750 or whatever. People bought them in the tens of millions. The industry was having a party. They were absolutely rolling in cash there for a little while. But now, due to a few factors, mostly the smartphone, but also the fact that I think a lot of people worked out that, you know, rollerblading was a trend, windsurfing was a trend, and so was the idea that if I buy a digital camera, I'm suddenly gonna be an amazing photographer and start a business. That was also a trend. It was just a trend. And the fact that the industry is returning to where it was is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But be mindful. You do need to be mindful that we all may pay a little bit more to continue to do what we love. And that's taking everything into account. Currency exchange, cost of developing new systems. And I was comfortably thinking that the market was probably roughly bottoming out around 2020. The bubble had burst and it was coming back to 1980 1990 levels. And if that was the case, I feel like the camera companies were finding their place and finding their way and the, 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 all that restructuring that has been put in place was finding it. It was settling. We were knowing where it was all at. But COVID-19 has hit. It is still impacting the world today. The impacts will probably still ripple through large parts of 2021. I don't think we've seen the full effect of it. And I'm not trying to be a doomsayer. I'm a glass half full person. This is me being glass half full. Certain industries, travel, and so many sub industries related to travel, concerts, weddings. There's just so many industries that have been affected. 
It's probably going to take the camera industry at least one more year, at least one more year to know how this all settles. But if we have reached the bottom of the market, the economies of scale where we are today, let's just assume that we have, this is what the photography industry has to work with. So working with that, they're going to put certain things in play. We're seeing it with warranties when it comes to Nikon. And I just want to remind you, they're just meeting the market. All the other manufacturers do the same sort of thing. To the best of my understanding, I have not researched the whole world and I have a feeling we're gonna see a lot of this sort of change happening across the market. I also wanna add that at the same time that Nikon USA was changing the warranties, they were also changing their Nikon professional services. And this is the brand newly announced Nikon Professional Services Support. And we don't get this in Australia, this is for the USA, but it looks pretty good to me. So basically, if you are an NPS member, you're a pro, what you get for free is the NPS hotline, dedicated NPS representative, priority repairs, no charge for sending, priority purchase delivery, which means if you buy things, you get them quicker, access to events, membership card, and a welcome gift, yeah, yeah, that's fine. If you spend a whopping, and I'm being sarcastic, only $150 a year, you get five equipment loans, three clean and checks, 20% off repairs, no charge for overnight return shipping on warranty repairs. So that's a quick turnaround. Loaners for certain repairs, and that's amazing. And if you spend $300 a year, which really isn't very much as well from my perspective, you get 10% off a one-time purchase. So basically what this is, if you spend something that's $3,000, you basically get the full amount of your Platinum membership back, up to 10 pieces of loan equipment, five clean and checks, 25% off repairs, which is significant, loaners on all repairs. This is good stuff. So you could basically make the platinum one work for you. If not getting the whole $300 off, you could maybe get, if you buy something worth $2,000, you get $200 and so on and so forth. This is pretty good. This is, if, if Nikon delivers on what they've just announced on their website for pros, this is all personally I could ask for and I would happily pay $300 in this country for this level of service. The interesting thing is I, I don't really use either of these two things. I use this loan equipment. I would certainly use this. I think that's great. It's good value. There is still a care factor here that we have to be really serious about and take really seriously. This is support for professional photographers, and I believe any of these is worth paying for. And as I said, if you get the top tier one, you can amortize most of it just by buying one piece of gear per year. Most pros would do that. So let's be realistic. If things have hit the bottom of the market, if we are back at the level, the sustainable level now, things will probably roughly stay where they are price wise. And you might see a little bit of trimming around the edges, which is what we're seeing with warranties and the shutting of the odd service center and things like that. This is just trimming. This is just balancing. It's a balancing act. But if the camera industry has not hit the bottom of the market and there's still a little way to go before we know what we can expect from sales year on year, then I want and I need everybody to accept that we might see one, two, 3%, 4%, 5% even price increases in our products until that moment occurs. And these companies have to, they have to make a dollar. That's what they have to do. Ultimately, they have to show profit. Now, I would prefer Nikon to stay in business. I would prefer that. And if it means that my $1,000 camera is $1,030, or my $3,000 camera is $3,090. That's fine by me. I would far prefer the Nikon Z system to exist and R&D to continue. I would far prefer to pay that extra 3% than to see, for example, the Z system go away. I think this is a very exciting system. I think it's only yet just begun to show us how magnificent it is and I would really be disappointed to see it go. And it's down to us to simply accept facts. If economies of scale are shrinking, there is nothing more a company can ultimately do 
like I said, if you used to sell 10, 10 million cameras and pay for everything with that, and now you've got to pay for everything with 1 million cameras, and sure, you've restructured, but there are some costs that you cannot change, like designing one camera. If you design one camera, if you design one camera and you sell a million of them, and you design one camera and you sell 100,000 of them, well, it's costing you way more per unit to design that camera if you're selling 100,000. If you're writing software, you only ever write software once, then you just copy it out. Economies of scale. So please, be realistic. We may have to pay a little bit more or they keep the prices down and they trim away at the edges a little bit so that they can keep the prices the same and try and keep us as happy as possible. But this is the reality. We are in a shrinking market and the only thing in reality that can happen is costs go up or something has to go down. All right. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, it, 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 I can imagine for so many people out there, it's a contentious and it's a big problem. For me, who's run a business for over 30 years, this is just the fundamentals. When you're losing here, you have to change there. You've got to just keep balancing it. And I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. And here I am in my warehouse. And if I, if I need to make a book or make a box, it's like, Matt, if you, if you buy a thousand boxes, we can do it for a dollar a unit. And if you buy 5,000 units, we can do it for 60 cents a unit. So what would you like to do, Matt? This is normal for me. I just understand scale. I understand manufacturing. And it's important for all of us to understand that we love an industry that's contracting. Scale is contracting, which means costs go up per unit. I'd love to have an informed, robust and thoughtful conversation about our industry and the, our real expectations on how it will survive the storm moving forwards. But things very much could get more expensive. Let's talk about it. Tell me in the comments below. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here today. It is spectacular to see you. I do hope you're well. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe. I'd love to see you again. Please share, please like it. Very much helps the video get out there. And you can see over 280 videos right down by just looking right down there. Okay. I'll see you very soon. I've got to um, do some printing. <laughs>